In this lesson, we are going to look at Euler's formula and some consequences of Euler's formula. So we're going to get to this formula first by considering the Taylor series expansion for e to the i t, where i is the imaginary number i, and t we imagine is some real number. First, let me remind you of what the Taylor series expansion for just regular x looks like. e to the x is 1 plus x plus x squared over 2, or you could write that 2 factorial, plus x cubed over 3 factorial, plus x to the fourth over 4 factorial, and you get the point. So I'll write dot, dot, dot. Now, everywhere I have x, let me plug in i times t. So on the left, we'll have e to the i t. And on the right, I'm just going to plug in first, and then we'll start looking at the powers of i. So first, we'll write down 1 plus i t plus i squared t squared over 2 factorial, i squared t squared over 2 factorial, plus i cubed t cubed over 3 factorial, plus i to the fourth, t to the fourth, etc. I'm going to write a few more terms than I did on the line above. So let me add, how about the fifth and sixth terms, just because we're going to end up grouping these into two groups. And I'd like to have enough terms in each group to see the pattern. OK, so I'll write i to the 6, t to the 6 over 6 factorial, and we would continue in that way. Let's go through this now and take every power of i and write it in the simplest form possible. So what we can say is this right-hand side is 1 plus i t i squared is negative 1, so this term I'll write as minus t squared over 2 factorial. And then i cubed is negative 1 times i, so minus i t cubed over 3 factorial. And then i to the fourth is 1, so this term, this fourth order, fourth order term, we can write as t to the fourth over 4 factorial. And then plus i t to the fifth over 5 factorial. And then i to the 6th is negative 1, so negative t to the 6th over 6 factorial. Just look at the pattern here and see if you can write down the 7th order term and then dot, dot, dot. Because powers of i are cyclic, we notice a pattern here. We have 1i, negative 1, negative i, 1i, negative 1, negative i. So the next term would be negative i t to the 7th divided by 7 factorial, and I think we've made our point. Okay. This is a complex expansion. Let's group it into real terms and imaginary terms. So I'm going to put the real terms together. That looks like 1, negative t squared over 2 factorial, the fourth order term, the sixth order term. Let's write those first. So we'll group them as 1 minus t squared over 2 factorial, and then plus t to the 4th over 4 factorial minus t to the 6th over 6 factorial. What would the next one be? It would be plus t to the 8th over 8 factorial, but I'll omit writing that. Okay, those were our real components. Now let's do the imaginary terms. So we're left with it minus it cubed over t factorial plus the 5th order term minus the 7th order term. So we can group them, and I'll go, so go ahead and also pull out the i in front. So we'll write i times t minus t cubed over 3 factorial plus t to the fifth over 5 factorial minus t to the seventh over 7 factorial. What would the next one be? It would be plus t to the ninth over 9 factorial, but no need to write that. Okay, what I would like for you to do is look at these two expansions. We have this one, this one. Notice what they have in common. You know, each one has its own pattern. They should remind you of something. So we've looked at the Taylor series expansion for e, e to the x rather, centered at x equals zero. Does this remind you of something similar? And does this remind you of something similar? So I'll give you a minute to think about that. Hopefully what it reminded you of was the Taylor series expansions for cosine and sine centered at, in this case, t equals zero. So this expansion is cosine of t. 
whereas this expansion is sine. So this whole thing we can write as cosine of t plus i sine of t. And this really nice, elegant way to condense all this down is called Euler's formula. So what it tells us is a complex exponential of the form e raised to a pure imaginary number. So here i was imaginary, t was real, can be written as cosine of the real part plus i sine of the real part. Notice this is a complex number, and we're saying its real component is cosine, its imaginary component is the sine part. We just saw that e to the i t could be written as cosine of t plus i sine of t. What happens if I just take that and adjust it to e to the negative i t? So let me write this down using Euler's formula. We can say that e to the negative i t, to use Euler's formula, I'm going to rearrange that as e to the i times negative t. Now we can take this, whatever we're multiplying by i, and plug it right into the formula. So this becomes cosine of negative t plus i sine of negative t. But we can take this further because cosine is an even function. If you think back to the Taylor series, it's the one that has all those even powers, which means cosine of negative t is the same thing as cosine of t. On the other hand, sine is an odd function. It has all the odd powers. So sine of negative t is negative i sine of t. So actually, I shouldn't have written the plus here. We need to do minus i sine of t. Now, if you compare this to cosine of t plus i sine of t, you'll recognize that it's the complex conjugate. So e to the negative i t is e to the i t, the complex conjugate of that. So let's visualize where these are on the complex plane. So here we're looking at the complex plane C, where this is the imaginary axis, and this is the real, the real part of any complex number. E to the i t is a cosine on the real part and a sine on the imaginary part. So if you squared each component and add them together, you would have cosine squared plus sine squared. I'll write that down in a second. That gives you one. So that tells us that e to the i t lives on the circle of modulus 1 in the complex plane. Let's place it here. This is e to the i t, which is cosine of t plus i sine of t. So if we think of this circle as the circle of modulus 1, like the unit circle in the complex plane, then this coordinate here, cosine of t plus i sine of t, this on that circle where this would be the angle t. Its complex conjugate is just going to reflect over the real axis, so that would be about here. This is e to the negative i t, the complex conjugate of e to the i t. It's also on the circle of radius 1. So here we have like angle negative t. And let me just write down what I mean when I say modulus 1. What is the modulus of e to the i t? It's the square root of the real component squared plus the imaginary component squared. So that's cosine squared of t plus sine squared of t. And so we can just verify that e to the i t lives on this circle of modulus 1. From Euler's formula, we get a famous identity called Euler's identity, which is what that equation reduces down to when we plug in t equals pi. Let me solve that two different ways. First, algebraically using the formula, then we'll look at it visually. So if I plug in pi for t, we can say e to the i pi is cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. Sine of pi is 0, cosine of pi is negative 1. So the right-hand side is negative 1. People often write Euler's identity by bringing the 1 to the left side so that they can say e to the i pi plus 1 equals 0. The reason why 
this form is often the most light versus this one, is that when you look at this equality, it links together five famous numbers in mathematics. So we have e, i, pi, one, and zero. So this is an elegant equation relating these five famous constants. So here I was able to get negative one on the right-hand side just by plugging pi into Euler's formula, but we could also get that geometrically over here looking at the complex plane. If t is zero on the circle of modulus one, that puts us at one on the real axis. Whereas if t is pi over two, that puts us about here at the coordinate i or up one unit on the imaginary axis. Over here, when t is pi, we repeat what we've already found. We're at negative one on the real axis. Whereas down here at three pi over two, if you rotate this way, pi over two, negative pi over two rather, we're at negative i. Notice this matches the, the powers of i. So we have one i, negative one, negative i, one i, negative one, negative i. So this nice pattern as we go around the circle in the complex plane. We've seen what it looks like to raise e to a pure imaginary number. Let's take e and raise it to the complex number z, where z equals a plus ib. So first I'll write e to the z. Then let's take z and replace it with a plus ib. Properties of exponents allow me to break this into the product of two exponential terms, one which looks like e to the a, and the other is e to the ib. E to the a is just e to a real number. So this is a real number. And then e to the ib is the complex number cosine of b plus i sine b. So I can take this and replace that using Euler's formula as e to the a times cosine of b plus i sine of b. We can leave it in this form. Sometimes we leave it written like this. Sometimes if you wanted to specifically have real component plus imaginary component, we could distribute and have e to the a cosine of b plus i times e to the a sine of b. So here we have the real part plus i times the imaginary part. What is this? It's a complex number, real part, imaginary part. Where does it live on the complex plane? Well, if you take each of these components and square them and add them together, we would be computing, start to compute the modulus of e to the z. So let me do that just below. We'll do the modulus of e to the z. That's going to be the square root of this term squared. That's e to the 2a cosine squared, cosine of b, that quantity squared. Plus similarly here, it's going to be e to the 2a times the square of the sine. Cosine squared plus sine squared is one. So if I factor the e to the 2a in front, we would have e to the 2a times one. So times cosine squared plus sine squared. e to the 2a is a perfect square. All that to say that this is e to the a. So this complex exponential lives on a circle of radius e to the a or modulus e to the a. What I would like to take you through now is an exercise where we use Euler's formula to derive the double angle identities from trigonometry. How we're going to get this is we're going to take this complex exponential expression e to the i t, and we're going to square this two different ways, and then we'll compare the two ways. So the first way is to take e to the i t and rewrite that as cosine of t plus i sine of t. So this is cosine of t plus i sine of t. Now let's square that. So all I've done at this moment is replace the inside. Squaring this, and I'm going to do this a little bit quickly because we've seen multiplying complex numbers by themselves, is we're going to take cosine times cosine. And then we would have i cosine t plus i cosine t. So we'll pick up two copies of the term i cosine t. I'll write that down in a second. Our final term would be plus i squared sine squared of t. So that's going to be cosine t 
t, the cosine squared, minus the sine squared. Okay, so that's the real component, and then we pick up two copies of i cosine of t sine of t. So I've broken that down into real and imaginary components. Let's now take e to the i t and square it a different way. So what we can also say is that e to the i t squared, we're using exponent laws, e to the i t to the second power is e to the 2 i t. Now this is e to the i times 2 t, actually let me write, write it that way, so e to the i times 2 t. This is just a complex exponential that we're ready to plug into Euler's formula, where 2 t is the argument that will plug into the cosine and sine expressions. So let me do that down here. e to the i times 2 t is cosine of 2 t plus i sine of 2 t. Okay. I've squared e to the i t two different ways. Take a look at these and see what you get if you match real components with real components, imaginary components with imaginary components. Everything I've written here is equal. They're all different ways to write the quantity e to the i t squared, which means this line is equal to this line. And if two complex numbers are equal, that means that their real parts have to be equal. So cosine of t, that quantity squared, minus sine of t squared, must be equal to cosine of 2t. Let's stick with the real components for a second and just write that down. So now we know cosine of 2t must be cosine of t squared minus sine of t squared. Similarly, if we look at their imaginary components, this part has to be equal to this part. So that tells us that sine of 2t is 2 cosine of t sine of t. These are called the double angle identities in trigonometry. The idea is that t is an angle. So 2t is double the angle. Notice that this kind of expression is something that you might see in high school learning geometry or trigonometry, pre-calculus, that kind of thing. When we see these identities, we normally don't talk about imaginary numbers and complex numbers. So what this exercise is really intending to show you is that sometimes we want to solve something involving real quantities. So this is an angle, a double angle, cosine, sine. These are, are quantities that we normally picture as, as involving real numbers. But in order to prove something about real numbers, we might switch into using complex and imaginary numbers to get there. So sometimes when people first learn about imaginary numbers, they say, okay, fine, i is the square root of negative one, but would we ever need this? If it's imaginary, is it actually useful? And the answer is yes. So not just in mathematics, but also in physics, engineering, we have formulas kind of like this one that we're able to get to through complex and imaginary numbers.